And our next speaker has a golden doodle puppy. But a puppy in itself is interesting. But he is teaching his puppy named Pickles to speak using a soundboard and augmentative alternative communication. So I'm sure we have lots to learn about that or his talk. But we probably won't learn about both. So please, everyone, give a nice, warm welcome to Madhava. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk, Remote Data Science Pets Unleashed. My name is Madhava. I'm an engineering team lead at OpenMind. I work predominantly on Sifting Grid, and I'm coming to you from sunny Brisbane, Australia. In this talk, I'd like to discuss motivations for remote data science, meet two pets, DP and SMPC. Uh, you'll get to see Sifting Grid in action. Later, we'll discover our private AI series. And finally, you'll get to hear a bit about what makes OpenMind unique. But I'd like to start with a key premise. We believe that our ability to answer important questions is limited because we can't access existing data. Existing data in another country, existing data in another organization, or even in another department. And that the solutions to many of mankind's most challenging problems exist, but simply that the, the access to train the models, the access to the data necessary to train those models does not. Um, and there are many problems like this, but I'd like to drill into two specifically today. The first one is breast cancer. Sadly, one in eight women will contract breast cancer in their lifetime. And tragically, over 700,000 women a year die of breast cancer. And one of the reasons why this number is so high is that if you today went into a hospital to get a mammography, um, the radiologist might look at it and they might give you a negative result. But there's a one in four chance in some places that you would get a false negative, which would mean that you would actually have cancer. You would go on to live your life for several years only to discover later um, and your treatment options would be greatly reduced. Now, this seems like the perfect problem that we could just throw a deep learning model at, right? Uh, a, a classifier and solve it. Um, unfortunately, in 2021, there's been a paper that's shown that um, 38 different AI breast cancer models, out of those, 36 performed worse than a radiologist. The remaining two were worse than two radiologists. So, you know, it's our belief that uh, this the, the reason why these models are so poor is because they probably weren't trained on enough data. Now, if, if we've learned anything from the latest state-of-the-art results over the last few years, that particularly for challenging problems, um, you know, 3 million images, which is what the estimate of the current largest uh, data set available is, is simply not enough images. Despite this, uh, we can estimate that over the last 10 years, we've probably had about 8 billion images collected. So, you know, the, the, the data exists to train this model, um, but we're only using a small fraction of it, and hence we're getting subhuman results. And so I wanted to hammer back this point that, you know, solutions like deep learning models, they exist, but the access to train on the private data necessary uh, to, to solve these problems, it does not. Um, and there's another example I'd like to show, and that is uh, global trade. So currently, the United Nations has started a, a new pilot program where they're experimenting with some of the pet technologies that we'll be discussing in this talk called the UN Pet Lab. And what they're looking at is a sort of um, import and export trade data that crosses uh, borders between their member nations. Now, in this case, you can see that things normally match. Every now and then, though, things just disappear. You know, on the left here, we have $3.6 million worth of straw, but on, on the American side, we're receiving $200,000. I mean, that's a huge difference. And this is a global problem. Up to five different member nations are getting together to try to solve this problem all without having to share each other's highly valuable and secret trade data. And so you can imagine in this case, the solution, which is simple arithmetic, already exists, but the access to this private data does not. And so you might be thinking, well, why don't we just put it all in a big database? You know, why can't we take 8 billion images and train, put it all in one database and train the world's best um, breast cancer model? Well, why can't we just put all of the world's private trade information into one database to answer this question? Um, there are a lot of reasons why we wouldn't want to do this, but I'd like to focus on one in particular today. And that is that it's simply not convenient. So imagine I wanted to um, solve this breast cancer problem. What I would do is I would need to go out and collect more data than anyone ever has before, right? So let's see what that would look like. Well, I'm gonna have to contact the first hospital. I'll get on the phone with their legal department, you know, and I'll, we'll have a lot of conversations backwards and forwards. And, you know, our lawyers are now gonna have to negotiate and this takes a really long time. Um, eventually they're gonna be asking us like, where are you gonna put that data? You know, how are you gonna manage the risk? And ultimately we may need to do some kind of background checks for our staff. 
And you know, this really just doesn't scale. Uh, imagine we completed this exercise, and now we need to rinse and repeat this with slight variations, hundreds or even a thousand times. This problem is intractable. It hasn't been done despite the money and the willpower. And so if you think about it, actually, you know, before the internet existed, we had this same problem with public data. If I wanted to book a flight, you know, I wouldn't just be able to go online and do it. I'd have to pick up the phone and talk to someone. You know, if I wanted to find out whether a shop was open, I couldn't just Google it. I'd need to pick up the phone and call them. And if they didn't answer, I just wouldn't know the answer. And so what we, we kind of need here is the same self-service model that the internet has provided for public data, but for private data. So that data owners don't need to be on the phone, you know, sitting, standing by waiting for your call 24 hours a day, you know, or, or answering lots and lots of emails to do with uh, legal negotiations and contracts, um, just so that uh, data, data scientists who want to study the world's, you know, private data to solve the world's most challenging problems, so that they don't also need to have uh, legal agreements and contracts with um, hundreds or thousands of different organizations. So, you know, um, the thing we're talking about here is kind of called uh, remote data science. And I'd like to drill in a little bit and show you sort of how it would look. So imagine you have, you know, your sort of uh, organization with your private data. You upload that into a server. We'll call this a domain, right? And then you have your external data scientists and they are, you know, sort of interacting uh, externally uh, over the network with this server. Now, they're able to ask uh, questions and answer, you know, the questions they have for problems by your API without having to copy any of the data. But they wouldn't just be interacting with a single organization. They would be on a sort of like federated network of, uh, of global private data. Now, you might be saying, well, we have an internet and we have servers. Why can't I just take my data, put it into a server, create an API, give a username and password and be done with it? Well, unfortunately, there's this problem called adversarial attacks. So I want to give you an example here of how this looks. Imagine we have a table of data containing the COVID positive results for a bunch of people. Right. This is uh, private health information. We need to protect it. But we also want to allow data scientists to be able to study it right in aggregate and get some population statistics. So imagine we have this API and they can say, like, OK, how many people have COVID? Right. In this case, we've got 11. That's uh, 11 out of 20 gives a 55 percent answer. Right. But what if we have a data scientist who's you know, a little bit naughty, a little bit nefarious, and they want to learn something about one of our subjects? If they were able to perturbate the query in such a way that they could exclude a particular subject from the data set in the query, then they might be able to learn something about that subject. So imagine in this hypothetical query language we have, they could do something sort of like, you know, names greater than or equal to B star. If they're able to do something like this, they could exclude someone like Andrew from this data set. So in this case, we're going to have, you know, 10 out of 20, so the, uh, out of 19. So the result has gone down. Um, now, if we step back and think about this, um, if we're able to, to perform a query, um, that's not modified, we, we potentially don't know anything about this subject that we're trying to um, uncover. However, if we were able to exclude them from the, from the query and compare the results, if that person had a positive result and they were removed, there would be less of them. And so we could infer that, that the number, if it went down, that they did in fact have COVID. And conversely, if the number went up, we could infer that possibly they, they didn't, right? So, you know, what's the solution to this problem? Anyone? Pets. <laughs> Let's meet our first pet. We've got Laplace, the differentially private puppy, and uh, I want to talk to you about differential privacy. So um, imagine, you know, I ask you to flip a coin. If it comes up heads, I want you to just tell the truth. So in this case, if you have COVID and the result is, is true, then you say yes. And if not, you say no. Um, and, it, you know, flip the coin. In, and if you get tails, what I want you to do is you're going to have to flip it a second time. So on this second flip, if it comes up heads this time, you're going to answer true, positive, yes, I have uh, COVID, irrespective of whether you do. And if it comes up tails, you're going to have to answer no, right? And this could be a lie, but it sort of depends on what your original answer is. Now, what this results is uh, that, you know, if you look at the ground truths and the answers that are given at any given uh, output, if you were to, to uncover what an individual's answer was, um, there'd be just as likely a chance that they were lying. <laughs> so what this does is it gives us some interesting properties, right? So one of our goals here is to ensure that statistical analysis doesn't compromise privacy. Um, you know, output should appear identical with or without a given row. So if we remove Andrew, it should look essentially the same. And we want to give our data subjects a, a concept of plausible deniability. So they can always say, well, you know, I was lying, even if you figured out what their answer was. Right. And to make this sort of work across large amounts of different types of data, we need to be able to tune the amount of noise that we're adding so we can adjust for a, a sort of privacy budget. Um, and, and, and most importantly, you know, um, this noise that we're adding, we're in control of it and we know how much it is, so we can just remove it, leaving the signal, allowing us to train models and do any kind of regular machine learning. So 
you know, you can think of this, it sort of works on you know, mathematical operations and functions or database queries. And, and finally, there's this concept we have of a, of a so-called accountant. And what that does is allows us to internally track the, the privacy of individual data subjects between queries and even between data sets. So there's a problem here though. You might've realized uh, earlier I was saying like, don't centralize all your data. And there it is, that's a central data set, right? So what can we do about this? I mean, we could we could split it up and decentralize it, but then like, how do we query it? Like that doesn't make any sense, right? That's ridiculous. So does anyone know what the solution is? Pets. All right, let's meet our second pet. We've got Beaver, the SMPC cat. SMPC stands for Secure Multi-Party Compute. So imagine that Andrew has the number five and he wants to have somebody else multiply it by two and give him back the correct answer without ever revealing the original number. That sounds like a riddle, doesn't sound possible, right? But it is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that original number and split it into two secret shares that when you combine back together, equal the original number. We're then gonna get two friends. We've got Kritika and George. And we're gonna say to them, okay, we're gonna give you a secret share each, hold on to it and, and don't share it with anyone. We're then going to, so at this point, essentially we've uh, uh, achieved encryption, right? Neither party knows the original value and they can't just guess it by, by checking different numbers, right? And additionally, we have this, uh, this concept of shared governance. To, to resolve the original number or the final answer, we're going to need to um, get all parties to work together to decrypt it. Um, so let's forward on the, the request we have to, to basically multiply by two. So everyone's gonna go and do that operation and they'll keep the result locally until such time as we're ready to, to bring it back together. So now we'll say, okay, let's bring all our shares together. We agree, let's add it every, everything back. And you can see that the result 10 is the same as if we had multiplied the original five. So if you think about it, models and data sets are just large collections of numbers, which we can encrypt and which we can compute. If we go back to this problem from earlier, right? Um, how would, could it be possible if I could try to solve this, right? Without getting on the phone, without doing legal negotiations and contracts, without being able to copy any data. Well, why don't we try some remote data science? All right, we've got our little friends and we'll go to our repository. Now, I know that this is an R conference and we are working on different um, language platform uh, clients, but at the moment it's predominantly Python. But if you pip install SIFT, right? And then you load up a Jupyter notebook, which of course is where all good data science begins. We're gonna jump in here to, to the first step. So we import SIFT. The next step is uh, we're going to go looking for uh, federated networks of data and we can use dot networks. And this is sort of like a Google search for private data. What we're gonna see here is a collection of different networks that we can join. So let's go look and drill into the first one here. We'll, get, we'll connect into there. And the next thing we wanna do is, is go looking at what domains or what websites of private data are available. So you can see here, Canada and United States. Perfect, that's exactly what I was looking for. So I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna get a sort of variable, a kind of handle to connect to these domains. And once I have that, the next thing I'm gonna um, wonder is like, what is my current privacy budget, right? Now, what is a privacy budget? Well, if you remember earlier, we discussed the idea that with differential privacy, we wanna be able to sort of like, you know, uh, tune this, this noise. And we also want a self-service model. That means that the data owner doesn't need to be there just to answer our queries and requests and, and approvals. And so if we're able to somehow measure the amount of privacy that's revealed during a query, we could estimate the amount that um, protects the data subjects while also allowing you to automatically download your results without anyone being there. So let's have a look. We've got 200 privacy budget. That's awesome. Okay, let's keep going. So and now we're gonna go try to find the data set we wanna work on. So in this case, we have on the left, we've got uh, the Canadian domain, right? And we're gonna go find the data set that responds to the American uh, data set. And we can see we have some tenses in there with shapes, that's great. And uh, on the other side, we're gonna go get the United States domain. We're gonna go looking for the data relating to Canada. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get two variables that represent each side. Now, if this was normally in my local Jupyter no notebook, right? These would be variables that would contain the actual tenses in memory, but we don't want that, right? We, we, we can't copy the data. So instead, what we have is a concept of a pointer. So it's, think of it as like a proxy object. It looks and feels exactly like the original object in my Python environment, except there's no data inside. I can't see it, I can't copy anything. So the simple example here would be like, hey, why don't we just subtract one from the other? Then we can figure out if there's a huge difference or not right? That should be easy in theory, but I would need to co-locate the data. I would need to copy it. So this shouldn't be possible. I'm here in Australia. I haven't made any phone calls or emails, right? 
And the data on the left pointer is all the way over in America in an encrypted government uh, institution somewhere, you know, and the Canadian pointer points to data that's over in Canada in a completely different computer system. So this should not be possible, but it is possible. And the way it works is, as soon as I execute this command, we create a shared multi-party compute tensor, and under the hood, it points to the original data. And just like you saw before, we're going to pass on this operation of minus, and both sides, both domains, are going to communicate to each other and agree on, a, on an encrypted protocol. They will encrypt their data, they will execute the, the operation that I've asked, and they'll store the results locally. At this point, we've achieved input privacy. No data has left either of these domains, right? So we haven't copied any data, but we've still managed to do encrypted computation. Now, the next thing is there's no point running a query if you don't look at the results, right? But to make sure that our data subjects that are, that are inside these data sets are protected, we need to apply some kind of differential privacy or output privacy. And so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell the system, hey, I would like to look at this result in a secure way. And so I'm nominating some privacy noise that I'm willing to sort of add. And what's going to happen is the accountant is going to look at all the data that I've used and it's going to think, hmm, okay, you know, this is how much you're using. This is how much privacy it would uh, reveal. And this is how much budget you have. Oh, you have enough. That's great. Okay. So we're just going to subtract it from your budget and we're going to publish the results into the domain available for download. So now at this point, I can take that with a simple dot get, pull back the shares, decrypt the result, and now we have it. There's, there's a significant difference between these two things. So that's super awesome. And, you know, finally, I still have a little bit of privacy budget left over. So you might be wondering, like, wow, this is like pretty interesting. How do I find out more about this? How do I learn about the technology, what it means, all this, all this terminology about pets? Well, we've created three free courses that you can take to learn all about this. The first one's called Our Privacy Opportunity. And it's tons of awesome video and, and quizzes that um, help you understand the terminology about pets and private AI. It uh, takes you through the implications for society and governance. And I highly recommend everyone takes this. It's non-technical. Um, and then, you know, our second course, which came out at the start of this year, is, uh, is called Foundations of Private Computation. This has got a whopping 60 hours of content on federated learning, cryptography, homomorphic encryption, secure multi-party compute. It, you name it, it's in there. If you take this course, you will know more about this specialized field than almost anyone else on the planet. And finally, we have a new course that just got released last week. It's called Introduction to Remote Data Science. And in this course, you're going to learn how to create your own domain, start it on your laptop or your own infrastructure. You'll learn how to take your data set and upload it in a, uh, in a secure way. And you'll learn how to do remote data science between you and, and your own domain or another domain. And finally, we'll show you how to join a, a network so that you can become part of the, the amazing discoveries of tomorrow. So there's three courses, all free and available now on courses.openmind.org. Uh, go join it today and you'll be one of 8,000 people who have already started. Um, and finally, I wanna talk a little bit about what makes OpenMind unique. So OpenMind is globally distributed. I'm in Australia. Um, as far as I know, we have people on every continent except Antarctica. So, you know, we've got people in Brazil, in the United States, in Canada. We have multiple African nations, people all across Europe, Russia, China, and lots of people in India. And this is really important because we believe that we want to build, you know, tomorrow's federated global private data network, and it needs to be accessible to everyone in the world. It needs to be equal. This isn't something we're just building uh, for Silicon Valley, right? And so it's it's crucial that we take into account all of the needs and requirements of everyone in the world. We're also a charity under Open Collective, uh, which is a registered 501c3 in America. And you know, essentially what this means is we can really focus on that mission. And I, I encourage you to check it out and possibly contribute some money. Um, you know, another big, really important thing about what we're doing here is it's all open source. We do all of our development on GitHub. Uh, we have over 90 repositories full of all sorts of interesting experimental encry encryption and cryptography projects, as well as obviously our, our big ones like PySift. Um, and recently, you know, I did, did a check and there's been about 500 unique contributors to all of our code over the years. Um, so, so come join us, you know, open a pull request. Everyone's welcome. And finally, um, we have a very active Slack community. It has over 13,000 members. Um, you can go join it at slack.openmind.org. If you have any questions about this talk, it's a perfect place to go. If you're taking any of the courses, you can get support and help on there. I'm there, you know, so come join the conversation. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say, you know, the point of this conversation has been to give you a bit of an introduction into to pets, to, to, to help you to understand that pets aren't just cute and furry. I think they're actually the future of data science. So, you know, tell everyone you know about pets and consider adopting pets in your organization today. Uh, my name's Madhava. You can find me on this Twitter and Slack uh, contacts. 
And I uh, just wanted to say thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.